Welcome, everyone, to The Smartest Doctor in the Room. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. Today, we are going to speak about pharmacy issues. And I, I think it's important. You know, the podcast is called The Smartest Doctor in the Room. But The Smartest Doctor in the Room really needs to work with a team of healthcare uh, professionals to really, you know, I guess, deliver the best care possible. So some of the things we're going to talk about today that I think you will find interesting is, does it matter where your medicine comes from? Are generic medications as good as brands? Is it worth getting a medication compounded? And then we're going to talk about a very special um, antioxidant compound called glutathione, which you might have heard of. And my guest today is an expert in that area. Now, unfortunately, in the current climate, very sadly, our pharmacists today have turned into what I call human vending machines. They tend to just dispense uh, on an automatic uh, basis medications that we pick up at our pharmacy. Now, for many of us, we, we, we don't remember because this wasn't always the case. There was a time that the local pharmacist, like your old-fashioned uh, family medical doctor, was revered and trusted for the information and guidance that they could provide you. In fact, some of the names that were used in the past to um, describe stores that were what we call today pharmacies, they were called chemists or apothecaries. It had sort of a distinguished name to them. But ironically, back in the 1950s or so, there really wasn't even that range of medications that are available today. So you would think that the pharmacist would, pharmacist would be even more important today than it was back in those days. My guest today, Nyan Patel, is an expert pharmacist in California um, who is also the owner of two different companies, Aura Wellness and Central Drugs, which are both based out of California, and I've um, done work with Nyan's companies. Um, he's also the author of uh, the book, The Glutathione Revolution, which is quite an excellent book for anyone wanting to know more about this molecule, which we're going to talk about today. I was fortunate enough to meet Nyan oh, probably about five years ago at a conference in Florida that his uh, pharmacy was co-sponsoring, uh, where it was talking about IV vitamins and compounding pharmaceuticals, along with Dr. Mitchell Gen, who I've had on this podcast. He is extremely knowledgeable and very good at explaining complex material. So I am really pleased to have Nyan Patel on the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Okay. So we're going to get into a couple of things, but first, as I start to talk about in the introduction, really the role of the pharmacist today. As I mentioned, it's it's kind of sad and it's been happening to doctors as well. Like we just sort of get put in this box of like just a dispensing machine. I, I know, you know, for quite a while, even in medicine, you know, with all the HMOs, I mean, patients used to just basically show up to a doctor's office and say, uh, I want a referral to this specialist. So the doctor was almost like a secretary. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, the same thing too with pharmacists. And the other really interesting thing is pharmacists now have been, they have to put on their, their Superman cape because now lately they're having to do COVID testing and give vaccinations. So I want to ask you, what do you think the role of pharmacists should play in patients' health today, um, in your opinion? So let me start off with the first, the, the most important part is if you think about the whole U.S. today, uh, who, which healthcare provider is most accessible to 95% of the people population? Pharmacist is within five miles of 95% of the American population today. Right. The most accessible healthcare provider with a doctor degree is within five miles of reach for anybody in the United States today. So that is, that is absolutely amazing. And I'm glad that the government recognized that that, that, was, uh, that that was available. And of course, we had to put a Superman cape on and we didn't even shut down one single day due to this pandemic. And we were giving vaccines. We have administered the highest number of vaccines ever delivered to American people ever. Yeah. So that being said that we were recognized for the first time that, hey, we are, we are here. We are yeah. not we are not anywhere else. So, but then this was kind of about fifty years later that we recognized that this was the most uh, easiest uh, 
healthcare provider accessible. But what, are the, what do we really do? That's always been a question. And I, you said very nicely that, yes, we are uh, basically a, a human vending machine. And that's what we have been recognized for years. And be, because the problem was that we need a lot of medications and automations was coming in and not at a fast pace. And so the pharmacists were defaulted uh, to be dispensing medication. But that's not the real role of a pharmacist. If it was just dispensing meds, I mean, it takes you literally six months of training, understanding what meds are, and anybody can do it at that point. Right, right. But the real, the real pharmacist, and what we call myself as a compounding pharmacist, and the term compounding pharmacist came from the term that, hey, we can make our own medication. Well, that's, what, what the, that's what the pharmacists used to do. I mean, people yeah. can really forget there's apothecaries, the chemists, they would get the mortar and pestle and grind the stuff. <laughs> and, it, you know, it had a little bit of mystery to it. Now everybody gets their prepackaged bottle with their medication. <laughs> you know, we got spoiled. <laughs> we got spoiled. But at the same time, the term company pharmacy is loosely used within our industry as the pharmacists that have stepped away from the vending machine pharmacist to somebody that wants to take care of the patients. And so we are usually behind the scenes working with the whole healthcare team, physicians, nurses, hospitals, uh, and trying to design therapy plans that are effective for patients. Yeah. And doctors are great, I mean, by all means, without knowing what's wrong with you, nobody can give you anything. Exactly. So the number one stop is the physician. And it takes sometimes one visit, sometimes 10 visits, sometimes a lot more visits to try to identify what the actual cause of the problem is. But once the cause is identified, they need a healthcare provider like a pharmacist to design a treatment plan that includes medication. And the rest would be, I'm, I'm sure the physician has a dietitian on, on board, a, a healthcare coach to, to have a multiple people addressing the needs of this patient. You're right. You're absolutely right. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt you because, you know, you're, you're saying something so important and I want, you know, because of what, one of the things about my, this podcast is really about the patients, the public being proactive. It's no, unfortunately now it really is up to the individual to help make sure that they have this team working in the same way a famous athlete or a big time politician. They have, they have their personal doctor, their personal pharmacist, the trainer, their physio, you know, the whole thing. And you made me think of something too, which just came to my mind is that when you were saying how accessible pharmacists have been, and they really have been really the un, un uh, heralded uh, super people, uh, superheroes of this pandemic. But if you were to ask, I would say 10 people, What's the name of their pharmacist? I think only one out of 10 would maybe even get that right. That That's concerning, right? It is uh, concerning. And do you think, because you bring up a very important point that I was going to ask in the next question, do you think it really should be important, and maybe even insurance companies would be smart to advocate that patients should at least have a consult at least once a year with their pharmacist to go over their medications? You know, because sometimes even doctors, even with all the <clears throat> EMR stuff, don't realize, oh, this doctor prescribed this, this doctor prescribed that, and having to sit down with your pharmacist and, and really making sure the patients understand why they're taking it, are there any interactions? You know, do you think that obviously would be a smart thing to, to do? Um, Dr. Mitchell, you said, you said something that is a law. It's required for us to do a once a year- Oh, I didn't know that. Medication review, it's been there but now, with the patient, with the patients, or you just look at it, you know, with quietly the, yourselves yeah, with the wow. patients. But wow. but one thing is that everything is governed by the insurance companies, and and I don't blame the insurance companies in this in this role either, because they have the hand in the cookie jar themselves. They are yeah. they are also providing medications to they're selling the insurance to the consumers and also providing the medication to the consumers. So it's like it's like there's a conflict, it's conflict of interest. That's yeah. I, I can't defend the, police, the insurance companies. They are. I, I know I know they have an important role, but yes. I just think, gosh, God willing, with AI and whatever more you know um, computing power, that things will get you know more organized and better for the public and the and the patients. Yeah. You know? But then you also said that one in ten person is the only one who knows the name of the pharmacist. The other nine do not know the name of the pharmacist, and so that becomes the insurance company takes advantage of that situation and say that hey, if you do not know your pharmacist we will provide you the consultation because we are insuring you. So, right. they are, so they're cutting the cost and right. they're not really seeing the whole picture. 
And so when, when my patients at Central Drugs, when they come to us, they get once a year, we call the complete medical review, CMR. We, we do that once a year for all our patients. And it's required for us to do that to make sure that we are providing effective care to all our patients. I mean, that is, that is the role of a pharmacist needs to be. So it's, it's there, but it's, it's amazing that you asked me this question because the law was there for a long time ago. And nobody knows about it. So I, I'm, I'm glad I asked that question. And as I said, some, you know, a lot of these things are on my mind. How do we make healthcare better? How do we get, you know, when they say, oh, you know, it's all the lip service, how do we get everybody healthier? Well, it definitely, you know, people need medications. Things happen in life. Nobody goes through life. I, I tell all my patients, I say, you know, it's very hard to find the quote perfect human being that is, you know, every blood test is normal and they don't need any medications. It's a little bit unusual, you know, God bless them if that's the case. But most people need the help and, and today's medications in, can improve people's quality of lives if done properly and uh and but they need support but you know you help me transition to the next big question i have because it does you know cost is always a factor and yes. people are always startled when all of a sudden they find out oh my medication like synthroid it's not covered anymore you have to have the generic you know or this medicine i was taking for my blood pressure oh it's not covered anymore you have you have to switch medicines because it's cheaper or there's the generic so I want to ask you that something that's been on the mind of, I think, physicians and patients for a very long time, because, you know, we almost forget now because it's, it's commonplace. But back in the day, people were very leery of generics, like, oh, no, it can't be any good. It's not the advertised brand. And then, you know, again, with the cost of medicine soaring and doctors telling the patients and everybody saying, well, it really is pretty much the same. <clears throat> what's, what's your opinion on generics? Can they be easily substituted for brands? When's the case when a brand should not be substituted? Just get your so, thoughts. So the generic versus the brand, it's, uh, it's, it's a million dollar question is to come down to it and say, hey, is it the same? Mm-hmm. Yes, the active ingredients is, is identical. Okay. And any manufacturer who's making generic medications today, it pretty much, pretty much have, have taken the brand name's formula and kind of photocopied the whole formula. Right, which is, you know, it's reasonable to do, even though the other company put in all the research and everything, but, you know, it, the law yeah. is the law, and it, it should help patients being more affordable if like a, if a hedge fund doesn't buy up the whole, you know, uh, exactly. quantity of it and then jack up the price, you know, That's but true. anyway. But when you when you said about Synthroid, and I want to make sure your viewer or our viewers knows one thing is that when there is a medication with a very low therapeutic index, what we call that, right? Because synthroid and thyroid medications are in micrograms. Mm-hmm. So right. Very, changing yeah. brands, even changing generic brands from one brand to another, like if you have one company's generic and change to another company's generic, it's not the same. So there are few medications with the low therapeutic index that we are very much concerned to change brands on them. Doesn't matter if it's generic or brand or doesn't well, matter. So let's stop on this. This is important. So are, are you saying that, because a lot of times patients won't even know, that was my next question too, where the, where the medicine comes from. The, you're saying that if somebody's, let's say, on the generic of Synthroid, which is levothyroxine. Yes. If for some reason, I don't know, you know, one month or whatever, the, the, the insurance company decides, we're, 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 or the pharmacy decides, we're buying it from this supply, because maybe, maybe the other one we can't even get anymore. Um, that could, even though they're both saying 150 micrograms, they could be quite different. And the difference comes not because of the micrograms. The difference comes because the manufacturing, there, there's always a tolerance. Mm-hmm. The tolerance some, and they, they, you have a 10% tolerance for back and for, uh, 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 front or back, right? Okay. And if you go from one brand to another and one person is 10% lower and one other person is 10% higher, still within the range, there's right. a twenty percent difference, and especially a medication like thyroid. Thyroid medication is very critical because a twenty percent version of thyroid medication can somebody can can. Yes, do. no, I know. I take care of thyroid patients all the time, and I and it's always a little bit baffling to me. Like when I, I tend to switch, I, I you know I try to keep people on the same medication if it's working and they're well controlled. Obviously, we'll go to any length to do that, but when it's not, I I take a deep dive and look carefully. And then I'm switching them to obviously other options or compounding options to try to achieve the best thyroid control. So that that's really important. Well, I, that's one of the points. So so something like a hormone like synthroid is important. 
What yes. about like blood pressure medicines, diabetic diabetic medications? Same same deal? No. So those have a wide range of therapy, right? So okay. those medications, even if it's off by 10%, 15%, 20%, it's not going to be that detrimental to your blood pressure or your sugar levels. Okay. And so in those cases, it's not a huge deal. And that is the, one of the reasons why they have to come back every every so often to do the evaluation to make sure that they are still within the range if they, if they change the medication. Right. We always tell our patients that if if ever we change a brand on you or we change a company for you, to go back in six weeks to a physician and just really evaluate, make sure that there was no changes made in your healthcare settings because we changed the brand of the medication. Because at times we all know uh, somebody buys some company out and they they will consign all the brands together and jack up the price. And when that yeah. happens, we have to scramble and find a cheaper alternative for this for our patients all the time. Yeah. And half, I would say 90% of the work we do behind the scenes, the patient don't even see it because yeah. they only see us fill a prescriptions, put a label on and give it to you. But they I don't know. see what goes behind all I know. You know, we'll, we'll get to later on too because you know, and I, when I took the course and I do the IV vitamins and injectable vitamins, it is so hard getting the sometimes the supply, especially with supply chain issues and everything. Okay. You know, and that takes me to my next question too. Does it matter, in your opinion, where the medication was manufactured, you know, whether it was China, whether it was India, some other place? I mean, should patients ever be concerned? Do you as a pharmacist say, uh oh, I don't really want to get my supply from this one? I mean, I know myself, like I've always trusted your companies <coughs> and also, you know, any other companies we, we try to look into because, again, it's like, you know, it's almost like a restaurant, you know, a good restaurant that gets good reputation. They have their people go to the market, check out the freshest fish or the meats and the vegetables. It's not so different, I would think, with pharmacy also. I mean, where are you getting your supply? It's it was not supposed to be any different because every facility that sells medication in the United States have to be FD inspected. Okay. But the concern has always been does the FDA come to visit you unannounced or after announcing you? Right. So if you buy medications in the United States, all US manufacturers are are get a visit from the FDA unannounced. Versus if you buy medication from India or China, or Brazil, or Europe, or anywhere in the part of the world, uh, FDA will announce that they're gonna come visit you. And so you have a you have a lag time where you can, there's mm. a potential, there's a potential of people kind of skirting some of the things before the visit. And so there's always been a concern of mine as a pharmacist that said, do I want to trust somebody uh, to sell me medication based on, hey, we'll we'll let you inspect us, but give us a month advance notice so we can clean up our act for that one month. Well, where do the major chains like CVS and Walgreens or whatever, are they, uh, I mean, it sounds like, a, I think a lot of medications are produced outside of the United States and not even in Europe, mostly probably either in India, China, whatever. Is that is that the case? And, and Yeah, most of the medications are either produced in India or second source is China. Mm -hmm. China is even harder than India. India is worse enough. And then we go to China and say, it's a whole different ball game over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the major chains, they have their own contractual of obligations with the manufacturers directly. So of course, their number one goal is to find the cheapest medication source in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as they quote unquote meet the FDA, meet the FDA guidances and hey, this is the FDA registered product and we can buy from you. If your price is uh, 50 cents cheaper, I'll buy from you. Mm. Uh, versus for, for smaller boutique pharmacies like mine, uh, we have to be very careful because we know our patients. But we know our family. We know the, who the dogs are. We know who the grandparents are. It's, a, it's sad to, for us to see that Sally down the street who got the medication from us had a reaction that it was never seen before. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for us, it's a lot more intimate role when it comes to prescriptions. So it's it's difficult for us to uh, to go to a source of uh, uh, generic medications and not have a uh, not, not have a proper sources of, of all our meds coming in. Is there anything a person is there anything they can do? I mean, should they question if they're and they don't feel good on a medication? Ask their pharmacist. Did you, I've seen even for myself with patients like where, you know, you see they'll bring the pill sometimes and it's the same exact medicine from 
but maybe two different pharmacies, you know, you know, again, a local pharmacy or a major chain and the pills, different size, different color, supposedly the same medication. Yes, yeah, same medication, different brands, different right. is that, factors. In. And if there is a problem, absolutely. They should go back to the other one or, or find out because yes. <laughs> that subtle difference could be, well, not, not make it be so subtle. If somebody's pressure, blood pressure is not being controlled or their thyroid's not being controlled or whatever it is, it might be the medicine. It is probably the medicine. And we want to make sure that we want, we want our patients to take what's, what's right for them. Right. But at the end of the day, we have to keep realistic expectations because who's paying the bills for the meds? The insurance companies. Yeah. The insurance company pay you one dollar regardless if your cost of medication is fifty cents or two dollars. Mm -hmm. And so, as a pharmacy, you have to find the cheapest options for your for your patients because right. that's what the insurance is paying for it. Yeah. And so, it is kind of sad for us to even think about it that hey, even though this medication is good for you. The insurance company says that no, we are not going to pay you for this brand of medication because this brand is too expensive. Well, that's always been the problem with the insurance companies. It's a race to the bottom. You know, it's like you know, back in the day with the HMOs, uh, doctors used to say. I used to, I used to be at meetings and they were complaining. You know, how can we compete with what the what the because unfortunately the insurance company is supposed to increase competition so that hopefully the best wins, but not always necessarily <laughs> the cheapest, right? And they say, look. We're all, you know, charging reasonable rates, and this guy is part of an HMO, and they promised to give him thousands of patients, but they're going to pay him half what, it, what they pay us. So, of course, the other person, for him to survive, has to cut corners and do things, and I can only imagine the same thing happens with yeah. medications. So, I, I think just the public should be aware of that. You know, it's you know, we 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 you know we have so much faith in the U.S. healthcare system, and and we do have great doctors and health professionals. <laughs> Um, but sometimes, yeah, money, you know, finances gets in the way. Uh, I want to get next to you, what your one of your super expertises is compounding versus off the shelf. Yes. You know, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the podcast, I said back in the day, the pharmacists were also known as chemists. And Drugs. it was common for them, druggists, well, I think drug, chemist sounds better. Yes. And it was common for, you know, the, the, your local pharmacist or chemist to compound Let's say, for example, your child needed an antibiotic and, you know, didn't want to, you know, didn't like the flavor. So you would make a special flavor for them and, you know, really nice things like that. But today I know you're doing a lot more complex things. So tell me why a patient should be interested in getting a uh, medication compounded um, versus getting it off the shelf. Because I surprisingly, too, sometimes you know, compounding can be, even though it would involve more manual labor, can actually be cheaper from what I've, I've learned. Uh, but also address, you know, there was a whole issue several years ago about a compounding pharmacy in New England, who unfortunately their batches of, I think it was injectable cortisone got contaminated with fungus. And that put a lot of pressure on compounding pharmacies. So with my complex question here, is it still worth it to or when is it worth it to get a medication compounded? Uh, for me, compounding is not about the medication, but it's about uh, patient care. It's okay. what, what is what do they what do they really need? It's they may not only need one medication compounded. Not every single thing they take needs to be compounded. And so, as a company pharmacist, our role is to identify what the patient's needs are. If they have an issue with the medication or with an allergic reaction with a particular excipients within the meds, we can't just take it out. So we have to make those medication. For sometimes those, you talk about thyroid, the low therapy index medications, if the, if the brand is, is, is out of business, that has happened over the last 10 years, we have seen so many companies stop producing thyroid medication because FDA was shut, was shut it down. And then I cannot keep on changing my patients from one meds to other to other every 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 two three months. Right. And so at times the physicians will call us and say, "Hey, can you just make it yourself? Because we know for sure the raw materials is available for you, and you have a consistent uh, batch productions all the time." And so we would make those medication medications because there's a consistency in the patient getting those uh, those meds all the time. And mm -hmm. those those. Those compounded meds are generally not available commercially in the strength that's available because if you're taking 50 milligrams and now you need 65 milligrams and the next strength is 75 milligrams, how do you cut the pill into 
like uh, two thirds of a pill. You can't just cut those pills up. And so it becomes very difficult. So on, on and off dosages, we do compound those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than that, there are dosage forms, right? You have certain things only available in tablets, but the person, a kid cannot swallow, swallow tablets and he needs to be in a liquid form. So we can't just crush the pills up and put it in a liquid form because it fills up all the excipients inside. So we have to buy the raw material, the pure chemicals, and make from them again. Uh, then sometimes, hey, you uh, you you need a, something that needs to be in a suppository form because right. It's, so it's it's like all these eye drops, injectables. I mean, you can the list goes on and on. But the compounding to me is more about a treatment plan than the medication. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, you know, because when I've used compounding or and I still do, it's also sometimes the vehicle that you want to get it to a patient. Like there are many times I'm a big proponent. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes about, you know, with vitamins. You know, I I like the sublingual route, you know, for a a lot of kind of vitamins, uh, you know, when possible, because you bypass the GI digestion of that supplement. And this way you don't lose what's called, I've talked about this before, the first pass effect where something that's broken down in the stomach goes to the liver. And a lot of times, you know, it's detoxified, but it goes, comes back into the circulation at a much lower amount. And if you're trying to get a good, good level. And I've also used compounding when, you know, I've sometimes like liked a, a compound that I know is good, but it's not available, let's say in a nasal spray, you know, I mean, again, it's common, you know, I deal a lot with uh, now, um, with mold, toxic mold disease. Yeah. It's really more rampant than I ever knew in the last five years. And a lot of these patients build up a lot of uh, what's called biofilm that with bacteria and from the mold itself in the sinuses. And there are really no uh, medications that have antifungal properties that are available off the shelf is nasal sprays. So I will go to a compounding pharmacy and ask them, to make up a combination that I think will help break up the biofilm and do that. So that's where I found compounding to be obviously critical. Yes, SIRS, uh, which were chronic inflammatory respiratory syndrome, SIRS or biotoxins and things like that. I think the latest number that I heard, again, don't quote me, I think it's about 22% of the population may be having some sort of that. A lot, uh, lot. yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a big issue. And you're right. The biofilm that's created, there's no meds available at this point. And we do compound a lot of those nasal sprays that includes antibacteria, antifungals, uh, just to improve the, uh, uh, just to break the film down so the medication gets absorbed. Uh, and so, yes, the company pharmacy has been not just making the medication, but providing solutions for physicians. They are trying to help these people because why do you get to 22%? Why can we cut the, when we first found out about this biotoxins uh, 20 years ago, we would have, if we had all the medications in the world, we could have stopped right there and there. We don't have to wait for until the population gets a critical mass of 22% of the population having this problem right. if the meds are correct. But the no drug company is going to make meds that is for small people, a small right, population. Right, right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> if they don't if they don't think they have the audience or the, the paying population, it's not going to happen. But sometimes so many of these things are like below the surface, simmering, literally. Yes. And yeah. uh, and it re- again, what I always I, I'm so in admiration of the patients that I see so many of them, it's they're being proactive, they realize there's a problem, they realize they don't feel well, sometimes a lot of their doctors are a little frustrated, because again, in, in regular medical training, you don't get exposure to this. I, I'm my, I'm a, you know, my background's in immunology, allergy and infectious disease. And I didn't get any of this training It wasn't until about five, six years ago, I took a deep dive to train with some of the best people. To, to learn this on my own, the same way when I went to your conference to learn about IV vitamins. So, um, but there's a growing population out there that's really, really frustrated. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get to uh, your special expertise, obviously vitamin use, IV vitamin use, um, and talk about your book a little bit, The Glutathione Revolution. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you some of the basic questions that are in the jacket cover of the book. Okay, Uh, because I'm familiar with glutathione and I know what I tell my patients, but for our listeners, explain to us what is glutathione? A lot of them have heard of it and and why you think it's so important. First of all, glutathione is the most abundant protein produced by humans. 
It's a protein. So as a chemical structure, it's a protein. As based on what it does, we call him uh, antioxidant, a superhero, mm -hmm. an enzyme, a detoxifier. You can call whatever you want to call based on the function it does. But as a chemical structure, it's a protein. It's a tripeptide, three amino acid chain protein. So that's why I like to start off with it because then becomes this, why is it so important? It's important to me personally or to anybody else is because it is the most abundantly produced by humans. And we only produce that in abundance because we want to help our body stay fresh and clean mm -hmm. uh, from oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is a big term. And I'll try to break it down into two or three different small subchapters so that way you understand that. The most important part is uh, something that we see, right? Chemicals like you, you ingest solvents like alcohol or pollutions or pesticides and fertilizers and all those things that you eat. That's easy because you know that you ate it, your body has to get rid of it. What you do not see is your exposure to sunlight and what kind of free radicals it's creating inside your body. Your body has to constantly get rid of all those electron charges that you have, that you have created uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis that you cannot avoid. Now, more than ever before, uh, we have electronic gadgets stuck to a body and those electronic gadgets are also increasing oxidative stress inside your body. It's oh, every day. Wow, yeah. And so the, the human deposits or the, or the amount of glutamine we can produce in, in humans on a daily basis doesn't increase as our need increases. There's a there's a bell there's there's a there is a ceiling and after that you can't produce anymore. It, what is is it made in the liver? Is that what the glutathione? In the liver. Is? Well, yeah. it's it's highly concentrated in the liver. Uh, it's made in every cells. It's made in all the cells, right? Mm -hmm. All the cells. It's in the mitochondria. And the challenge has always been: can we increase mitochondrial levels of glutathione, not just your blood levels? Because anybody mm -hmm. can increase your levels in your plasma or your water components in your blood. You can just give an IV uh, dose of glutathione in your blood and it, you, you do a blood test and you say, oh, you have enough glutathione. But they don't tell you that it's only there for 14 minutes because it's all in the water levels. It is not in the mitochondria or in the, or in the blood cells. So, mm -hmm. so knowing what do we need, how much do we need, and, and where do we need it, right? We take vitamin C, for example, every single day. We take vitamin D every day. And we pop a pill or we take sublingual drops or whatever forms or IVs. Uh, and then what? We assume that magically it's going to go where it's supposed to go and do the tricks for us. And, and the only, thing, only way we know that it did something for you is how you feel, right? Oh, my wrinkles went away. Oh, I feel better. Or my blood test shows that, I, I'm, I'm, that, that, that I'm okay. But I don't feel good, but, but my blood test shows I'm okay. So now what? How do we... How do we know everything is working just fine? Or do, can I take like 50 vitamins in, in every single day and be healthier than everybody else? Uh, all these are great questions. And the simple answer is, how do you feel? Have, have we ever stopped anybody's aging process? Um, have we reverse aging for anybody? Uh, and so it's vitamins, I see them as uh, supplementation, but it does not, and it, it, it will not replace proper eating habits. All right, so what, let, we're gonna get to a couple of things. Right. What, uh, I've seen this, I really haven't ordered it a lot myself, but would you say, so the, to measure the glutathione, just to get an idea in the cells, we, like the glutathione in the red blood cell, is that a good test to give yeah. you at least a baseline if you might be deficient? Yes, that would be the only way to find out what the deficiencies are, but okay. keep in mind, glutathione is, is very unstable in, inside mm -hmm. your blood cells. So by the time you draw the blood, and sent off to the lab is already been oxidized. Oh wow! So okay. what you're what you're measuring is oxidized levels of glutathione, but that is okay. Okay, that is still okay because guess what? Oxidized glutathione inside red blood cells, your body can regenerate itself to make it glutathione again. Mm -hmm. so you know, what, what what foods are high? Would you say if someone's trying to ingest you know healthy glutathione? Like, I think it was asparagus, isn't that one of the asparagus foods? Asparagus is one of them. There's a lot of meat sources in there, avocados. But you know, it's not just one thing. It's mm. it's you have to get those three amino acids: cysteine, glycine, and glutamine. 
Well, uh, so and cysteine is the is the is the least available to our body. So anything that you eat which is high in cysteine, like sulfur containing products, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have increased levels of glut. There's a potential of increasing glutathione levels in your body. Well, you know, you just think what Chuck and I, you'll be an expert. I, I interviewed Nancy Clemus once uh, back in the day because she's an expert in chronic fatigue from um, from the University of think, South Florida, and. Uh, she was saying in one of the talks that she gave, like when she read, because she believed glutathione was very important for chronic fatigue patients, but she used to tell them to take it as NAC because the glutathione, when you take it orally, just gets quickly, That's right. know, I guess, deoxified. So, so tell us a little bit about the best way to increase glutathione in our body. Or what's the best way? Orally, are injections? I do injections and IVs. I include it because I deal with very sick patients. So, give me the spectrum on, Absolutely. you know, who who might need what, and you know. Because you know, not everybody needs injections, obviously. <laughs> so the highest level that you can increase glutathione levels in your body, in your blood, is via injections. Hmm. No doubt about it. But the only drawback to that, it never gets into the red blood cells because within 14 minutes, everything is, is out of your blood. Uh, but is, does it do something? Let's say, would, I mean, a lot of practices give that IV. Yes, yes. Ions. Is, is it, does it do like what we say, flush out the liver a little bit? Is that, is that a, an accurate yeah. description or no? So according to, there was a research study done in 1991, uh, and then what they found out was when you give IV glutathione, uh, it doesn't increase the red blood cells levels of glutathione, but it does increase cysteine. So even though the body is breaking down the glutathione, even in your plasma, what it does, it, it will increase cysteine levels. So eventually, over the next four to six hours, whatever the cysteine is available to your blood, your body will try to make glutathione out of it. I like, see. So, that, but it says, so, in, so in that case, to me, it says, hey, can I just take cysteine? And the answer is absolutely. That would be probably be the better option if you can find it because there's no company. Sorry, IV cysteine, you said? Cysteine, yes. Really? Well, but company farmers are not making it right now because oh, okay. it's not available. So, so the only choice you have is glutathione at this point. The best way to increase glutathione until now, until we have of my product line, was NAC because NAC is the easiest way to ingest cysteine. Your body takes the cysteine, adds the glutamine and the glycine with two enzymes, and well, it comes a glutathione. Okay. And so that was the best way to increase RBC levels of glutathione. Our technology, we figured out we can take the glutathione molecule and make, shrink it down into small particles and get to you, get, get to your body through your skin within within minutes and mm. so and so now you can take a product uh put, apply on your skin and in in 15 minutes to one hour later you can measure your blood test and measure rbc levels and it goes from here to here instantaneously wow yeah so and, and what's the dose in that i was going to ask you too with the iv you know like let's say david promoter who became very famous with grain yes. brain and everything too but in his early days he was very focused uh on you know, in some of his protocols about doing like IV glutathione, and he would go up to pretty high doses for patients with neurological conditions. Yes. What, what's the dosing in your topical um, glutathione? So, so let's talk about IV first. So IV okay. dose starts about 600 milligrams. Right. Dr. 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 You talked about Dr. David Palmutter. He right. used up to 3.8 grams. Yeah, he went really high, right. Pretty high. But the, he was dealing with really sick people. Yeah, he was dealing with people with Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's. Parkinson's Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that's the range of the medication. So naturally, when I first started doing my research on glutathione, I started using five to 600 milligrams of the topical version of glutathione. And what we found out was was way, way, way too strong. Uh, people were people were having um, uh, having reactions. Well, have too much energy, way, way out off the ball energy. And if wow. you have too much energy, you know, you can also get some rashes on, on mm -hmm. the body and things like that too. So when we found that out, I said, okay. So one of the physicians I work with in Utah helped me. Design a, a design a protocol, and he said, "We said, setting said, let's go back to like, like bare minimum, like, like fifty milligrams, hundred milligrams, two hundred milligrams. Let's start with that one." And so we went down to three hundred milligrams, and we thought even that was too much. So then the next study was like, okay, we did 50, 100, 200 milligrams, three hundred, four hundred milligrams doses. So that's the span we did. What we found out was hundred to hundred fifty milligrams is all you need per dose. 
to get your RBC levels back to normal. Mm -hmm. That's it. So in that case, we, we found out, hey, if that's all you need, why do we have to inject so much to get no increase? And, mm. and by the way, if it's only 14 minutes stays in your body, you can take the topic of version and it stays up to four to six hours in your body. If you do it twice a day, it's like you're taking three or four treatments every single day. Mm. And so, so to me, that was, it was absolutely a no-brainer. Uh, one of the reasons I stopped making IV glutathione and, and started focusing on the topic of version was, was my ma main reason was because of that. I said, hey, knowing what I know now, why would I be even consider making it in, in IV forms? Because the other one is way better. That makes a lot of, that's very interesting. I want to ask you a question too, you know, again, from your experience with that too. You know, I, I, when I've given IV glutathione, again, a lot of patients will tell me after they feel good and stuff too, but I've had some patients when they get, it's, it looks like an allergic reaction, but it's not. They, they'll get throat tightness. They'll get very flushed. Is that, is that from it's releasing something in the body or? Two things, yes. So what we have found out is it, it can happen with two reasons. One is it's trying to detoxify a liver too fast, too soon. And that mm. can get you some reactions. And what we see is usually, what you see is flushing. What I've seen is as, as much as rashes. And the rash can happen not at the injection site, but anywhere in the body. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is also overproduction of nitric oxide. Uh, and nitric oxide is a good thing when it's in limited quantities. Right. That's right. why you work out every day. And right. When you do a workout, you feel good, right? You're right. tired, but you feel right. good because of the nitric oxide production. Your blood pressure goes down. It's mm. good. Uh, but when you produce too much of it, that's when the issue comes up and hey uh is it is it too much for me can i am i able to sleep at night time? is there a way like, i'm just so curious too because when i've seen this reaction it's not often but when it has happened like uh you know it's not like an allergic reaction like you need epinephrine i think that would make people more agitated is benadryl or something just to, is, it to, is it histamines being released what, what is it what can you do to counteract it a little bit or is it just time they have to just kind it's of just time it? because the, again keep in mind the iv glutathione is only 14 minutes half-life Oh, so it's fairly from, quick out of the system. Yeah, so within half an hour, it's already out of, it's, uh, out, already out of the system. Interesting. So it's just time. A lot of mm -hmm. times the flushing can also be because, because uh, the infusion rate was too high. So mm -hmm. if you shorten the infusion rate down a little bit, that can help your patient also feel better. Yeah. One other question on the technical IV stuff, because I'm, I'm interested in it, obviously, because I'm still using it to help patients who are on medications that I, I think it's yes. helpful to them, is that, um, oh, what was I going to ask you, that the... Um, when you give it, you know, a lot of practices do IV push, which I think tends to cause a lot of this flushing. If you still put it in the bag, is that still you know, like when there's a little bit left? I mean, what's, what's the preference there? So glutathione is very reactive. So mm -hmm. if you put it in a bag, it will, it will mix with water and it gets oxidized pretty fast. Okay. Uh, so the ideal way to, to deliver glutathione uh, intravenously is to an IV push. It is to a push. It is the push. And sometimes if you push it too fast, is you make it the flushing type uh, uh -huh. symptoms. So you just have to re reduce the infusion rate down a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was really good. So, why, now, you know, a lot has been made of NAD, you know, uh, <laughs> why, why is glutathione better or are they, are they just both special molecules? You know, David Sinclair, um, you know, who's done a lot of research on, on NAD as being the immortal, you know, antioxidant uh, mm -hmm. molecule. Well, how, how does glutathione compare to NAD? Well, um, I, I wish I, 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 and I am working on NAD right now as well myself uh, behind the scenes, but it is a very, very reactive molecule. Uh, glutathione to me is a lot more stable has a lot more functions uh, compared to what NAD can do for us and is easily accessible at this point when it comes to glutathione. We've already mastered the way to deliver glutathione to a body. And so now my job is to, to, to look at all the uses that we can do. So then, then the only thing left is whatever glutathione cannot do, that's the time we want to see, okay, can can NAD help with us at that time? It's NAD, NAD and NADH has to be in combination, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, and if 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 people listening want to be able to get the uh, the, the glutathione, the topical, how do they do it? Do they contact um, Central yeah. Drugs or they, they can go to aurowellness.com, A-U-R-O wellness.com. 
uh, we always recommend them to write the physician's name on the uh, when they do a checkout because we want to know who the doctor is. And so if they're listening to this podcast, I want them to put down Dean, Dean Mitchell's name on there so that we know that they heard from our podcast, they came to you. They don't need, uh, do they need a prescription or no? It's just, they don't need a prescription. Because it's, it's topical, right? It's topical. It's, it's, uh, it's over the counter. Do they have to watch out for anything like being in the sun or anything like that too? Like so when they put it on, it doesn't really matter? It, it goes in, inside your body in literally 30 seconds to a minute. So and is there a certain location in the body the patients should put it on? Or so, is the way they want it to work? I mean, they put it on their face and their body, you know. And they can put it anywhere they want to. So so here's the thing. Like, I don't put it on my face. I put it on my belly because I have a large belly. And I can just rub it on. It just does in 30 seconds. But okay. my wife would put it on her face. A lot of female patients, they'll put it on her face because it gets too far, right? It reduces oxygen stress in your because face, you never cover your face out. In, uh, and so this, that's the most exposure to pollution is on your face. Mm. So, you, so you get two for it, right? You you, co- you get rid of all the pollution and all the oxygen stress in your face from glutathione. And at the same time, you get the benefits of him getting it absorbed in your, inside your body. Yeah. So, yeah, I know in Florida or Texas, I was once at, when I was at your meeting, it was interesting. There were people from like these uh, aesthetic uh you know, companies that were there. They were very busy pushing also IV glutathione because people were coming in, they want to get rid of their wrinkles and their skin looks better, all that kind of stuff. So. Now we can do this topically. We don't have to do any more invasive therapies. No. No. And well, this has been educational for me, I hope for my listeners. And I think again, going back to what we talked at the beginning of the podcast, how important really having a pharmacist that you trust and that knows you to be on your healthcare team. Uh, Nayan Patel, thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch discussing patients and other stuff in the future. No, thank you. And I want to say a closing statement for myself is, uh, I hope one day that all healthcare providers uh, can work as a team. I still even see, still see today that People are compartmentalized that they want to see their practice only, a pharmacist or a doctor or a chiropractor or an acupuncturist, everybody. If we can all work together because we all have one goal. Absolutely. And can we make our patients healthier? And if we can do that collectively, I don't think so. There's any disease that can stop us from living our life. All right. I think that's a great way to close. Thank you so much.